Iwo Jima was more than just a battle. It was, a, it was actually a 36-day descent into hell, hell on earth, because that's what it was. Four point five miles long and only two point five miles wide, the tiny volcanic island of Iwo Jima is nothing more than a small speck of land in the mighty Pacific Ocean. But for thirty six days in nineteen forty five, the black sands of Iwo Jima would see some of the most brutal combat of the entire Second World War. Since capturing the island of Saipan in mid nineteen forty four, U.S. bombers had been raiding the Japanese home islands in an attempt to destroy its vital war industry. However, the tiny island of Iwo Jima proved to be a thorn in the Americans' side as it housed an airbase for Japanese fighters to intercept the long-range B-29 bombers on their way to Japan. In addition to this, the island was acting as an early warning system for the Japanese home islands. Therefore, to eliminate the threat, US commanders decided in late 1944 that Iwo Jima had to be silenced and thus Operation Detachment was given the green light. Taking some hard-earned lessons from the Battle of Peleliu, US commanders realised that a far more intense bombardment of the island's defences was required to disable Japanese defensive positions before the Marines made their landings. Therefore, in the 70 days leading up to the invasion, the US 7th Air Force dropped 5,800 tonnes of bombs on Iwo Jima, whilst the Navy would also provide a three-day bombardment in the final lead-up. Following the bombardment on February 19, 1945, some 30,000 marines would land across a two-mile beachhead between Mount Suribachi and the East Boat Basin on Iwo Jima's southern coast. The beachhead was split into six landing zones, with the 1st and 2nd Battalions of the 28th Marine Regiment landing at Green, 2nd Battalion, 27th Marines landing at Red 1, and 1st Battalion, 27th landing at Red 2. Going ashore at Yellow 1 would be the 1st Battalion 23rd Marines, with the 2nd Battalion 23rd following on their right flank on Yellow 2. Finally, 1st and 3rd Battalions 25th Marines would move in from Blue 1 on the right flank of the invasion. Once ashore, the 28th Marine Regiment would attack straight across the island to the northwest coast, isolating Mount Suribachi in the process before assaulting and securing it. The 27th Marines would follow the 28th's advance to the northwest coast before wheeling right to secure the northeast portion of the island. Driving in from beaches Yellow 1 and 2, the 23rd Marine Regiment would push to secure airfield number 1 before striking out and securing airfield number 2. And on their right flank, the 25th Marines would wheel right immediately after landing and secure the high ground around the quarry. With such a large invasion force and a massive pre-invasion bombardment, US commanders expected any Japanese opposition to be mopped up rapidly. However, US intelligence had failed to determine the true size of the Japanese garrison. Lieutenant General Tadamichi Kuribayashi, who was in command on Iwo Jima, like the American commanders, had learned valuable lessons from the Battle of Peleliu and thus creating a labyrinth of mutually supporting defensive positions throughout the island, Kuribayashi deployed an immense defence in depth strategy. By the time the invasion would arrive, some 18 kilometres of underground tunnels connecting hundreds of pillboxes, blockhouses and artillery positions were completed. On Mount Suribachi alone, there were over 1,000 different cave entrances and pillboxes, ready and waiting to greet the US invaders. All Kuribayashi and his 21,000 strong garrison had to do was safely wait out the pre-invasion bombardment in their underground bunkers 
before taking up their positions in the moments before the marines arrived. As dawn broke on February 19, 1945, US Marines clambered into their landing crafts under the protection of a tremendous naval and air bombardment. At 8.57am the guns fell silent as the first waves approached the landing zones, and by 9.05am the first of 30,000 Marines had landed. However, unlike previous battles, the Marines were surprised to find no Japanese opposition and for the next hour, several waves of landing craft hit the beaches bringing more marines and equipment ashore. Many began to believe that the pre-invasion bombardment had annihilated the Japanese garrison, but little did they realise that Kurabayashi had specifically instructed his men to wait an hour for the landing beaches to crowd up with marines before firing to inflict maximum casualties. Just after 10am the uneasy silence was shattered by a thunderous Japanese artillery barrage. The crowded marines were cut to pieces on the beaches, unable to dig foxholes in the soft volcanic sand, all they could do was scramble inland to their objectives. Bogged down in the black ash, most tanks and Amtraks were picked off by accurate Japanese artillery fire, leaving marines to slog it out on foot. By 11.30am, elements of the 23rd Marines managed to reach the southern tip of airfield number 1, but had to fight off a fanatical Banzai charge before digging in for the night. Meanwhile, on the left flank, the 28th Marines, driving in from green, along with the 27th from red 1 and 2, had managed to reach the northwest shore and isolate Surabachi. However, on the right flank of the invasion, the 25th Marine Regiment ran into fierce resistance around the quarry. Japanese resistance was so intense that of the 900 men who landed with the 25th Marines that morning, only 150 were still in fighting condition by nightfall. That's a casualty rate of 83.3%. By sundown, the Marines had already suffered 2,420 casualties, and with only one of the first day's objectives being met, it was evident that the descent into hell on earth had only just begun. Bad weather hampered any advance on D plus one. Even so, the 28th Marines began their assault on Mount Suribachi, but holding a tremendous height advantage, the Japanese defenders inflicted horrific casualties on the Marines, forcing them to dig in and wait for reinforcements after only advancing 75 yards. Amidst heavy rain, the 23rd and 27th regiments pushed forward against fanatical Japanese resistance, and had managed to capture most of airfield number no. 1 by the end of the day. However, on their right flank the 25th marines were still locked in fierce combat around the quarry, and were unable to make any headway. For the next few days heavy rains continued to batter the island bogging down US armour and forcing the marines to slog it out in hand-to-hand -hand combat. However, on D plus 4 as the rains finally eased, the 28th marines launched an all-out assault on Mount Suribachi, and found relatively light opposition, as many of the Japanese defenders slipped away through underground tunnels to link up with the main defensive line on the northern end of the island. Finally, at 10.20am, the stars and stripes could be seen flying atop Mount Suribachi, a scene that was later famously recreated for the world's press. Now with Mount Suribachi in their hands, the marines could focus all their firepower on pushing north and capturing the remaining airfield, and by the end of D plus 5, the 23rd and 27th marine regiments, along with reinforcements from the 21st regiment 3rd marines, who had come ashore on D plus 2, fought their way to the edge of airfield number no. 2. On their right flank, despite taking horrendous casualties, the 25th Marines, with support from naval batteries, finally drove the Japanese defenders out of the quarry and secured their D-Day objective. By D plus 6, the 21st Marines had suffered heavy losses, and after just four days on Iwo Jima, they were pulled back to rest and replaced by the 9th Marines who launched an all-out assault on airfield number 2. 
Despite being supported by 26 Sherman tanks and artillery fire, the 9th Marines were driven back by unrelenting Japanese defensive firepower, and by the end of the day, they had only advanced 200 yards. However, on their right flank the 24th Regiment, which had been brought ashore to support the 23rd and 27th Regiments, ran right into a formidable collection of Japanese defensive positions around Hill 382, which would become known as the Meat Grinder. Unable to make any progress, two more regiments were brought up in support, however, by nightfall on D plus 8, the Marines only managed to encircle Hill 382, despite suffering horrific losses. Fortunately, their left flank was secure as the 9th Marines finally secured airfield number 2 after two days of brutal combat. The next few days marked the descent into hell on earth for the weary Marines. A bloody and battered 9th Marines were replaced by a patched up 21st Marine Regiment that they themselves had relieved only six days previously. And on D plus 9, whilst pushing towards airfield number 3, they came under a heavy counter-attack by Colonel Nishi's 26th Tank Regiment. Despite the stiff resistance, the 21st Marines reached and cleared the village of Motoyama, and as night fell, they took up positions overlooking the unfinished airfield number 3. By now, combat fatigue was spread in like a plague through the Marine ranks, with most units being subjected to prolonged periods of intense combat and sleep deprivation. With casualties mounting at a lightning pace, combat command in many units had been passed from captain to lieutenant to sergeant. In most instances, companies were now being held together by a handful of NCOs. However, under these dire conditions, the Marines kept pushing forward, and by the end of D plus 12, airfield number 3 was in their hands. Back on the right flank, the 25th Marines kept up the pressure on the Japanese around Hills 382 and the Turkey Knob. The Japanese resistance in this sector was some of the fiercest seen so far in the Pacific theatre of war, so much so that despite shelling the blockhouses and pillboxes continuously for days, the Marines had no choice but to engage in fierce hand-to-hand -hand combat and torch the defenders out of their hideouts with flamethrowers. This close combat and the sheer intensity of it further escalated marine casualty rates, and by the end of the second week of combat, some 16,000 marines and 14,000 Japanese soldiers had become casualties of war. The next few days saw intense firefights erupt all around the Motoyama Plateau and the Minami village, as the 24th and 23rd marines under the cover of a hail of naval gunfire smashed their way forward, and finally, by the end of D plus 16, had captured Hill 3A2 and surrounded the Turkey Knob, whilst also digging in outside the village of Higashi. Far to their left, the 26th and 28th Marines faced similarly brutal opposition, but by nightfall on D plus 16, had managed to clear both Nishi Ridge and Hill 362B, securing the left flank of the Marines. With much of Iwo Jima now in American hands, the US Seabees went to work and quickly got airfield number one airworthy. This enabled B-29 superfortresses to make emergency landings on their way back from bombing raids over Japan, as well as enabling US Navy aircraft to fly out the overwhelming number of wounded and dead Marines. The next three days saw the Marines finally break through to the northeast coast, splitting the Japanese defensive forces into three smaller pockets, at Cushman's Pocket and on the eastern and northern ends of the island, where Kurabayashi and 1,500 Imperial soldiers were dug in in what the Marines named the Gorge. By D plus 26, Colonel Nishi and his soldiers had been burned out and killed, finally sealing the fate of the resistors at Cushman's Pocket. To their right, D plus 30 finally saw the marines clear the last Japanese defenders out of the eastern side of the island, around the village of Higashi. However, to the north in the gorge, the 27th marines in an attempt to clear out Kurabayashi's stronghold got badly mauled and suffered some 2,000 casualties before finally breaking through and capturing it on D plus 32. 
The long drawn out battle now seemed to have finally reached its conclusion. But in one final suicidal attack, the remaining 300 or so Japanese defenders silently infiltrated the American lines during the night of D plus 33. Led by sword wielding officers, the Japanese launched a well planned three pronged attack around airfield number two, killing 44 airmen, nine marines, and injuring over a hundred others. But as dawn broke, around 262 attackers lay dead, with a further 18 taken prisoner. It is believed that Kurabayashi personally led the final charge, but his body was never identified. On D plus 36, after 36 days of bloody combat, the island of Iwo Jima was finally declared secure. Despite learning some hard lessons from the Battle of Peleliu in 1944, and firmly believing that they were far more prepared for the Battle of Iwo Jima, US commanders once again failed to gather sufficient intelligence on the strength of the Japanese resistance on the island before the invasion began. As a result, Lieutenant General Kurabayashi's well-prepared defensive system drew the Marines into highly effective killing zones. This would ultimately turn what was planned to be a short campaign into a dragged out 36 day descent into hell and the Battle of Iwo Jima will always be remembered as the bloodiest and costliest battle ever fought by the US Marine Corps. In total, the Marines suffered 23,157 casualties of which 5,885 were killed whilst the US Navy suffered 2,798 casualties, of which 881 were killed. The Japanese on the other hand suffered 19,977 casualties, of which all were killed, with some 216 Navy and 867 Army personnel taken prisoner. This was the only battle in the entire Pacific theater of war where US casualties were greater than the Japanese. Thanks for watching, and if you would like to learn more about the battles of the Pacific War, then check out my previous video on the Battle of Peleliu in the link on screen.